Hi everyone. So here's a short video to introduce um, the concept of energy storage and capacitors. Um, one way to conceptualize what capacitors are doing is that they're storing charge. So we talked about how if you hook up a battery to a capacitor, the electric field created by that battery pushes charge onto each of the plates um, where it can be held. Normally you wouldn't be able to hold a bunch of positive charges together and a bunch of negative charges together, but you can if you put a battery on there. And then if you disconnect the capacitor plates from the battery, you can just hold charge on those two plates. And that's fine. Another way to conceptualize what's happening with a capacitor is that you're storing energy. And that arguably is a more flexible way to think about what a capacitor is doing. Because um, what happens with a capacitor is when you store up all that charge, you're holding a bunch of positive charge that wants to run towards negative charge and a whole bunch of negative charge that wants to run towards positive charge. And as soon as you reconnect the capacitor to any other system, that's exactly what's gonna happen. All that charge is gonna flow off of the plates unless there's another battery there that's gonna push the charge or keep it back on the plates. And so you've just stored up a bunch of energy that can then be released in the form of the motion of the charges as soon as you plug that capacitor into another system. So the goal of this video is to formalize that, um, to quantify it, and to show you an example of how you might use that energy approach to think about um, problems where it could be tricky to think about what the capacitor is doing quantitatively otherwise. So let me draw a picture here. So I've got a couple of parallel plate capacitors, and um, I'm gonna use parallel plate capacitors in my picture here, although there's no reason why the capacitor that we're discussing has to be a parallel plate capacitor. Um, so imagine that I hook up a battery to these plates. So let's say then this wire now goes out to the, to the positive terminal of the battery. And then this wire goes out to the negative terminal of the battery. So I create a, there's a potential difference in the battery and in principle I create a potential difference across the plates. But it takes time for that to happen. So what is the process? Well, imagine some positive charge coming from the positive terminal. And I'm gonna talk about charge carriers being positive here, um, but in reality, of course, they're usually electrons. So let's say I've got a positive charge here. It started at the battery. And now when I hooked up the plates to it, now that positive charge has somewhere to flow. So there's a whole bunch of positive charge built up at the battery. And now I've connected the system to it and there's space for that positive charge to flow to. It can flow onto this left, or left uh, capacitor plate. There's space for it there. And it's really easy to do that actually, because if I just have one charge here, when I move that charge, it's for free. There's no forces pushing against that charge. It didn't cost me any energy. I didn't have to do any work to push that positive charge from the battery to this positive plate. But meanwhile, while I was doing that, there was another positive charge that started here, but then that positive charge now had a space to flow to the negative terminal of the battery. So effectively what happened here is if I, I ended up with some net positive charge on the left plate and some net negative charge on the right plate, and that's kind of what we expect to happen. Then um, what happens next is, well, there's another positive charge that comes from the positive terminal, another positive charge on the right plane. And that positive charge, now I can move it maybe onto the left plate, but it, it now is a little bit harder to do because it's feeling repulsion from the top charge. So maybe I can put it on the plate, the battery is strong enough to do that. And meanwhile, this charge on the right plate is also moving off of here, but it's again, a little bit harder to do that too. So it costs a little bit more energy, it takes a little bit more work to move that second charge um, onto the left plate and off of the right plate. And one way to quantify how much work is being done is, say each one of these little charges um, has a magnitude of charge dq. So these are all dqs. So, what we know is that if we want to calculate work, 
the magnitude of the work will be just whatever the magnitude of that charge is times the voltage difference, the potential difference that the charge is moving across. And when we move charge onto the left plate and off of the right plate, we create a potential difference. There's gonna be some potential difference here. And we know what that is. That's equal to Q over C. Um, that's how a capacitor works. The potential difference is proportional to the charge on the plates. And that's another way of saying is as more charge ends up on the plates, the potential difference between the plates gets bigger and the amount of work it takes to move the next bit of charge on the plates gets bigger too. Why does the potential um, of the plates matter here? Well, because effectively what has happened is there were really two charges involved, but it's kind of like one. So the total action was when I put a charge um, Q here, DQ here, and I have a charge DQ here, then there's this action happening, happening together, which is there's a positive charge moving up this wire onto the positive plate uh, there, let's say, at the same time as this positive charge is moving off of the plate that's becoming negative. Um, and so effectively, you could think of one charge that started on the negative plate, started here, traveled all the way down this wire, towards the battery and then all the way up from the battery to the positive plate. Effectively, what happened is there was a charge DQ that got moved off of the negative plate and onto the positive plate. All that action happened at once. So the potential difference that that DQ undergoes is just the potential difference of the plates. You move it from a spot where the potential is whatever it is on the right plate to a spot where the potential is whatever it is on the left plate. So the potential difference is just Q over C. So we can start thinking about what happens if you add up all the works you do when you start from say no charge on the plates, like right when you connect a battery to empty plates to when those uh, capacitor plates are completely full. So if I have a little bit of work and that little bit of work is given by a little bit of charge moving some through some potential difference, then if I want the total work done, the total work done will be the, that integral. Um, at least the magnitude of the work done will be this integral, uh, dq times v. And then I'm integrating from when the beginning of this problem to the end. And the beginning is, as I've stipulated it, when I had no charge on the plates, so dq or the q initial is zero, to when I've got some final charge on the plates. I guess it could be at any time. I'll just call the charge at that time big Q. Um, but I also know that V can be written in terms of Q like this. In this case, my integration variable is little Q. So let's say that at some time, there's uh, some amount of charge little Q on the plates. And then I move a little bit more charge onto the plates and I get a little bit more work. And then I do that for every value of Q between zero and big, every value of little Q uh, between zero and big Q. And that's how much work I got. So I'm just adding up steps of moving more and more charge onto the left plate and off of the right plate. Um, but this is an integral that you can just do. It's just C is a constant. You could pull that out of the integral, zero to big Q, Q dQ. So if you have integral Q dQ, you just get uh, one over two Q squared evaluated from zero to big Q. So in total, you get one half Q squared over C. That's the work done, but this is also really equal to the potential energy stored in the plates um, because we've written really the magnitude of the work here which is how much energy you're storing. You're, you're doing work, which is storing energy. And I've just neglected to talk about the signs here because I don't really think that they're helpful for understanding the physics. But the delta U here, the change in potential energy from beginning to end of this process is one half times the square of how much charge you put on the plates over C. Um, 
you can write this a couple of different ways. Um, so using, oops, let me fix that. You can uh, write using this relation uh, between V, Q, and C. You can do some substitutions if you want. So you could write this as delta U equals one half C V squared. You can write it that way. Or you can write it as one half C times V, just substituting from that relationship V equals Q over C. Um, that tells you how much potential energy is stored in the capacitor relative to the capacitor being empty. Um, okay, so let's try to use this and think about how to use it in an example. So let's take, um, let's take an example problem. Okay, so imagine I've got a parallel plate capacitor here and I've got it hooked up to a battery with a voltage V. And I take the plates that are initially separated by distance D. Let's say the plates have a, um, a separation D. And then I move the plates from D to uh, 2D apart. So the plates go like this. So I move them apart like that from D to 2D. Um, and I wanna know how much work it takes to do that. Um, this is actually a more complicated problem than it seems because as the plates move, charge will be moving onto and off of the plates. So there's charge moving not just with the, with the, with the plate that's going from, from here to here, because it's not that the charge is staying fixed here, it's that the voltage is staying fixed. So the charges, if you tried to do this from first principles, integrating charge, it would be pretty difficult. But there's an easy way to think about it if you use this concept of how much potential energy is stored. Because the work done here in this action will just be the difference in the potential energy stored in the first case to the second case. Because if I started with a certain amount of potential energy stored, and then I ended with a different amount of potential energy store, stored, the work done in this process is whatever work was done to change the potential energy. So let's look at that. So in the first case, I'll say there's some initial potential energy. Um, and that potential energy is just one half uh, C initial, the initial capacitance, times V squared. I'm going to write this formulation, this one, one half CV squared, instead of one half, uh, um, one half CV or one half Q squared over C, because voltage is constant here, but charge is not. Um, so this will make things a little bit easier. I can write this in terms of D because we haven't really defined the capacitance. Let's say that the plates both have um, cross-sectional area A here. So then I can write the capacitance as um, A epsilon naught over D, V squared, okay? And then there is some final capacitance too. So the final capacitance in blue is when the plates are 2D apart. So it's same thing, one half C final uh, times V squared. So UF is now, C has the same form, but a different D over 2D V squared. Um, and if you look at it, UI and UF are the same, except for this little factor of two right here in the denominator. So what I can write is that um, UF equals one half times UI, because the only difference is that factor of a half. So the final potential energy that's stored is half of the initial potential energy. So how much work was done? So the total work done is just the difference here. So um, was UF minus UI equals a half UI. 
Um, and was it easy or hard to do this? Well, it was hard to do this because you have one plate that has positive charge, one plate that has negative charge. If you try to pull them apart, there's a force of attraction between them. So it's gonna be, it's gonna be hard to do this. It's gonna cost you something um, and uh, you lose some potential energy as a result. Um, okay, another variant on this problem. So what if I have a similar setup except the, whoops, what's going on? Whoops, whoops. So let's say I have a similar setup so I have two plates um, and they're initially separated by a distance D and they move to be a distance uh, 2D apart, something like that. And they both have cross-sectional area A, except this time they're not hooked up to a battery. So this time um, the voltage is not constant as they, uh, as they move from their initial configuration to the final configuration, but there's nowhere for the charge on the plates to go. So if both of them have some charge Q, there's some positive charge Q here and some negative charge Q here, those charges stay static. So I can, and I can ask how much work was done in this process. Um, well, let's see. So if I, use the same approach and say there's some initial potential energy which is equal to one half cv squared that's going to be very difficult because c is changing and v is changing but if i use one half q squared over c this is a little bit easier to think about because only c is changing here q stays fixed which is nice so ui plugging in for one over CI. So if I plug in one over CI here, I get D over A epsilon naught times Q squared. And similarly, the final potential energy when I'm in this configuration um, is one half Q squared over C final. U final equals one half 2D over epsilon naught. Um, times Q squared. Okay, so now this is equal to two times the initial potential energy. So you actually store more potential energy in the configuration here versus in the first case you store less potential energy in the final configuration. So what does that mean? That means that if you were to, in the second case, if you were to pull these plates apart and all the charge is just sitting on the plates, it has nowhere to go, and then you were to release the plates, they just snap back together really, really fast. There's tons and tons of potential energy stored. So as you pull these things further apart, all you're doing is creating the opportunity for more speed as they snap back together if you were to release them. In the battery case, the battery represents a reservoir of positive and negative charge that these, um, the charges that are stored on the plate wanna to flow to. So there, it's not as though when you pull the plates apart, it's always like you're creating more and more potential energy. In fact, as you pull them apart, you're creating less potential energy. There's probably some limit um, there. But um, in this case, in the second case, you get a uh, different behavior because the parameters of the system are different. The charge is constant in this case. Um, and you can see that immediately um, when you um, use this kind of energy analysis. Um, so that, that was an example of how you might use the result that was derived at the first part of this video, um, and I hope it was helpful. Okay, bye.